Good morning. <laughs> it's really great to see you all this morning. Um, if I haven't met you yet, my name is Alex O, oh, Director of Campus Life. And I have had the privilege of uh, being kind of the leader for the Welcome Weekend team this weekend. And on behalf of our team, we are so thankful and grateful to have met many of you and have had the pleasure of really beginning this Welcome Weekend and this year here at Azusa Pacific together. So thank you all so much. And just the conversations that I've had with parents and students, um, our team, we are just so encouraged uh, just for uh, the many conversations that we had and we are just looking forward to a wonderful year. Uh, just wanted to share uh, that after this session, uh, we're actually going to be transitioning to uh, lunch. And uh, it's going to be a time where we want to invite you to uh, uh, enjoy lunch at a local eatery in the city of Azusa or in Glendora um, with family and friends. And for those that maybe don't have families and guests with you, on East Campus, uh, we'll, we'll have the 1899 Dining Hall open. You can use your wristbands, um, and we'll be able to provide you a meal there. Now, with that being said, after the lunch, our students-only portion of the Welcome Weekend continues. And so really, that lunch time is an opportunity for you to say goodbye to your students. And so as I was thinking about that, and I was, as I was asked to make that announcement this morning, I was reminded of my two kids. So I have two kids, uh, Lucy and Luke. Lucy is five and a half, and Luke is three years old. And just this past week, Lucy started kindergarten and Luke just started his second year of preschool. And I had a, such a difficult time saying goodbye to them, <laughs> to kindergarten and to preschool, so I can't imagine the feelings that you might be feeling this morning and the goodbyes to your students. So maybe for your families and guests, I would encourage you to take the time that you need and to share what's on your heart, what's, on, what's been on your mind, maybe for a long time, would encourage you to lean into that this morning. And for the students, maybe some of you are saying, finally, the time is here. <laughs> maybe some of you are not looking forward to that goodbye. Whatever's on your heart that maybe you've been wanting to share with your families and guests, I would encourage you to share that today. Maybe the ways that you've been, you know, maybe the way that you've been feeling thankful and the ways that they have been providing physically, mentally, spiritually the ways that they have been praying for you and been caring for you for many years. And I know that I need to call my mom more often than I do. <laughs> so I would encourage you in this season, today, take that opportunity and say thanks and express your gratitude. I'm sure mom and dad, especially as a parent myself, would really appreciate that. So with that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to our chapel band. They're gonna be leading us in worship this morning. This is the band that's gonna be leading us in worship all throughout the academic year. And so it's really a blessing and a pleasure to introduce them. And with that, turn it over to James as he leads us. If you can welcome them with me. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, my name is James. I work for the Office of Corporate Worship and get the pri privilege of getting to worship with all your students in chapel throughout the year. Um, this is just one of our many, many bands that we have that we uh, get to worship with throughout the year. But I just want to take a moment just to invite you all, if you're willing and able, if you'll stand to your feet. And before we begin, I just, in the spirit what, of what Alex was saying, I think a lot of times, um, at least for me, I have to remind myself of the reason why uh, we engage in corporate worship together and worship with other people is, is not just to acknowledge the wonderful and amazing character of our God and our Savior, um, but we do that also to interact with each other and experience uh, a community moment where we can sing together, where we can pray for each other. Sometimes even if that means grabbing the, the hand of the person next to you and singing with them and praying for them. Um, and I just want you guys to take advantage of this time that you have, all the families and friends of the students uh, today, just to take advantage of this time to acknowledge that we are a community together uh, and that we get to worship together uh, in, a, in a spirit of community. Amen? Amen. So we're going to sing all creatures of our God and, God and King together, and we'll just lift up our voices this morning, okay? Good morning, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome back to day number three of Welcome Weekend. 
Again, my name is Koba Canales. I'm Dean of Spiritual Life here at APU, um, and we have had a blast just getting to know you over the last few days. Um, and it's my honor uh, to be able to share the Word of God this morning with you all, and thanks for joining us. Um, hope you enjoyed that Lion King clip. I really just picked it because I learned my new trick for this year. Whenever somebody asks me a question that's too hard, I'm just going to say sambisana, squash banana, and just start dancing around. Um, seemed to work out well for Rafiki, but we'll see if it works for me. Um, but he really, he asked Simba this, this simple yet profound question that has always stuck with me. Uh, and, uh, and I got a chance to see the redo that they did this past year. Um, and that question is, who are you? Who are you? Are you? Question of identity. It's a question that I want us to look at today because I do believe that the Bible has much to say about identity, who we are. Uh, and before we dive into some of these passages in the Gospel of Luke um, and, and talk about this really important topic of identity and calling, um, I want us to uh, just take a moment to, to pray, if, we, if you would join me in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to gather together. We thank you that you are here. Uh, as James mentioned, as uh, the team led us into your presence and allowed us to experience you in a profound way this morning, we recognize that you are here. We ask, Lord, that you would speak to us through your word. Would these not be my words? Would they be yours? Uh, would you guide us as we move from today into this year? We surrender this time to you in Christ's name. Amen. I also wanted to uh, recognize uh, Alex O and the team from Welcome Weekend who put all of this on for us for this weekend. I see some of the team over here in this general area. They worked so hard all summer long to make sure that this weekend was possible and they did a phenomenal job and I'm really, uh, really proud and thankful for the work that they put in so that we could experience this together. I also want to uh, acknowledge and recognize our new president, Dr. Ferguson uh, and his wife, Grace. If you wouldn't mind standing, please. We're excited to have the Fergusons with us. Uh, their uh, leadership here at APU so far has been encouraging, has been exciting, has been hope-filled, and we look forward to what God has in store for us under their direction and leadership over the coming years. Uh, so this weekend, Friday, we came together and we started off. Some of you may have moved in, others of you came and maybe met some folks within our commuter life office. You started to get some rooms settled or hopefully had a chance to meet an alpha leader or somebody representing, acclimating you to this campus. We gathered together in the evening on Friday night and we collectively raised candles in the air that uh, demonstrated to us not only the uh, enlightenment that comes through education, but more importantly, the light of Christ that we are called to pursue uh, with faithfulness as disciples and scholars. Yesterday, some of you came back, way to go. Um, and you continue to learn about resources to help you thrive and be successful uh, as students, enjoying community and having fun and maybe making some new friendships over the course of the day. And then here we are today, Sunday, the third day of Welcome Weekend, the day that you give 17 awkward hugs by. Okay, seriously, this is the last one. Bye. I love you. All right. There's going to be a lot of dads who are going to cry today, okay? And let me just tell you, okay, uh, 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 it does, just because you cry doesn't mean you're not tough. What I would say is this, the tougher you are, the harder you cry, okay? That's just my perspective. I'm a dad. I got three of my own, so don't be afraid. Let the tears roll. If you're not the kind of guy that cries, it's all right. They're on the inside. We get it. Today's a big day. Today's a very big day. And so as we look at the scriptures for this season, preparing for a new year, preparing for a new season, preparing for a new chapter, preparing to come into college and ask questions that maybe one has not yet had to ask, such as, what do I want to do for the rest of my life? What career do I want to pursue? What major should I be part of in order to align me with all these different things? And these questions can have the potential to make us be driven by fear. Sometimes that fear leads to paralysis and we don't know what to do so we don't do anything. Sometimes that fear leads to other kinds of anxiety so we just kind of go crazy and just start running around like, uh, like a chicken with a head cut off. Um, but we don't need to operate by fear as people who are surrendered under the Lordship of Christ. That as much as these questions and this season can have the, the potential for us to feel fearful about what this year may hold, whether or not I'm going to make the right friends, whether or not I've chosen the right major or should change the one that I've already chosen, rather than be driven by fear, uh, we can instead be driven by something else, which is being driven by the fact that we have been called already 
by God, daughters and sons, daughters and sons. So the big question I think that many universities will help students ask is, what do I want to do for the rest of my life? I want to submit this morning that I believe a better question is, who do I want to be for the rest of my life? See, what we do, that thing can change from one year to the next, from one season to the next, but who we are is that thing that is consistent. Who we are is important to us because we can operate out of that identity no matter where we go, no matter what job we're called to, no matter what major we're in, no matter what school we're at. Who we are is more significant than what we do. I remember being a freshman in college uh, and I was at another school uh, and I made the wrong choice. So I transferred to APU, so that was a better choice. Um, and when I was at the other school, I'll leave it unnamed for now, um, I, w I started off as an engineering major. I had a meeting with my academic advisor. I was an athlete. The advisor said, it is 99% impossible. I don't even know what that means, but it was 99% impossible for you to be an engineering major and to be a football player. You're going to have to choose one or the other, right? And so I made the most mature decision as an 18 year old, no offense to the 18 year olds, I shouldn't have said that. Okay. And I said, I'm choosing football. Okay. So, so then later on, I ended up not choosing engineering um, and being undeclared and wondering what I should do. And it was in that process that I had to, to spend time seeking God like I never had in my life, uh, in prayer, asking big questions like, where am I supposed to go and what am I supposed to do? So listening to this voice, the voice of God is something that I want to talk about. And one of the analogies that helps me to understand this is something that I grew up with that maybe some of the younger folks in the crowd here, some of our new students maybe never experienced this. But when I was a kid, uh, my family, I had a big family. I'm a, I come from a Mexican family, so we roll deep, okay? Just saying, all right? I know we have some Mexicans in the house because, yeah, 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 never mind. So we used to pile into my mom's van, okay, and we would go to the drive-in movie theater to watch movies. There was a drive-in movie theater, kind of like the one that we have right next door, except for now we use it as a parking lot, right, which is probably what happened to most drive-in movie theaters. But when you go to the drive-in movie theater, okay, for those of you who've never had the privilege of going, okay, um, when you go there, there's a really interesting way that you have to get connected so that you could follow along with what's happening in the movie. See, the movie is on the big screen, but there's no sound. It's because they have maybe one, two, three, four, sometimes six different screens that are all around this drive-in movie theater. So the only way that you can tune into the sound is they would have these big giant poles all throughout the movie theater, and you would have to drive right up to a pole, and on the pole there was this wire that was hanging down. Okay, so like you had to be an engineer just to watch a movie back in the day, okay? So you take this wire, and then you would connect it to this really long uh, pole called an antenna that cars used to have, okay? Um, and so you would connect it onto the antenna, and then that's not it. You're not ready to watch the movie just yet. What you had to do is go on the AM uh, station, and you had to start twisting the dial until you figured out which channel that movie was playing on, right? And it was kind of like a, a, you know, a little bit of a game. You're like, okay, oh, yeah, we got it. We, oh, wait, wait, wait. No, no, no. That's Roger Rabbit. That one's playing over there. Okay, let's tune it back. No, no, no. That's Ninja Turtles. Keep going, right? And so we, you would have to kind of dial it in, and sometimes you go over this way, sometimes you come back a little this way, and finally you find the right movie that you're watching with the right sound that's coming through, and that's a lot like tuning in to hear the voice of God in our lives. It's a process. It doesn't just happen easily because we desperately say, God, I need something from you right now. It's a process that we learn gradually to tune in little by little over time so that we can get in tune with the voice of God in our lives. In fact, the voice that we're talking about here, vox or vocare in Latin, is where we get the word vocation. It comes from this very word. So that means that a vocation and calling are actually synonymous. We don't always use them synonymously in our culture, but this concept is voice. So when people say, what vocation are you? What they're saying really is, what have you heard that you should be doing? So when I think about this, the voice of God in our own lives, I recognize that for many of our new students who are here, you may hear God's voice in very unique ways. Some of you may be very foreign to this idea, and you might be coming into APU saying, hey, I'm going to have to learn a little bit more about what this whole thing is all about. But we operate differently and we hear God differently. For some, it's quiet time. For some, it's taking a, a run or a walk or being in solitude or a good in-depth conversation with those who mean the most to you. Maybe for some, it's serving 
In fact, uh, in a book that I'm reading through right now uh, by a guy named Robert Mulholland, he talks about these various ways that we connect with God and hear from God. He says, for some folks, it's action. For some folks, it's reflection, service, awareness, knowledge, devotion, discipline, and spontaneity, that there are all these different ways that we can learn to hear from God. But in the scriptures, we do have some wonderful examples. And the example I want to look at today is the way in which Jesus himself heard the voice of the Father. So in Luke chapter 3, this is the story of Jesus' baptism. Uh, I'm going to start in 21 and 22. Uh, These uh, should be on the screen for you. It says, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son. I'm going to say that one more time. A voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. Later on in Luke chapter 4, so just the next chapter over and following, Jesus is led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, and he's met there by someone named Satan. Hasatan uh, in in Hebrew simply means the accuser, the one who accuses. And so this accuser meets Jesus in the wilderness, and he starts his accusation by asking him, if you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. Jesus responds by quoting scripture and he resists the first test. Then Satan shows Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and he tells him they will all be his if he bows down and worships Satan. And Jesus again denies Satan's test. And one more time, Satan says, if you really are the son of God, then throw yourself from this temple and God will send angels to protect you. And Jesus for the third time quotes scripture to defend against the temptation of Satan. There's a wonderful book by uh, uh, an author that I love uh, named Henry Nouwen called In the Name of Jesus. And in that book, he talks about three, these three temptations, and he references them as the temptation to be relevant, the temptation to be spectacular, and the temptation to be powerful. Think about that. The temptation to be relevant, spectacular, and powerful. As we get ready for this year, as we get ready to go into college, as we get ready to pursue a degree that leads us hopefully to a career and different opportunities, are we going to be driven by these three temptations or is there going to be something deeper that captures our heart as we ask the very good question of who am I and who am I becoming? These three temptations persist. So in the same chapter of Luke 4, 16 through 19, uh, I'm going to read this for you. He says, it says, Jesus went to Nazareth, Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, and listen to this, the Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Those are very different than the temptation to be relevant, spectacular, or powerful. You see, what we see happening in these two chapters, chapter three and four in the Gospel of Luke, number one, the voice of God establishes identity. He tells Jesus, you are my beloved son and you fill my heart up. The second thing is the enemy comes, the accuser comes and starts to question Jesus' identity and and purpose. He says, if you are the son of God, two out of the three temptations. And Jesus, owning his identity as the Son of God and calling, he says this, since I am the Son of God, not if, but since I am the Son of God, then I am called, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he continues to give his mission statement through Isaiah. The assurance and affirmation of knowing that he was the Son of God gave him clarity about his identity and purpose and mission. Too often when we think about calling, we do it from a lack of identity. In fact, we want want our doing to affirm our being. 
We try to prove that we are worthy to be called son or daughter by virtue of what we've done or not done, by how we've behaved or not behaved. We strive to reach for things that we think will garner recognition and affirmation. But in the life of Jesus, affirmation and recognition came first. In these three passages from Luke 3 and 4, we see the interplay between Jesus' identity, his personal mission, and his ministry with key voices surrounding the narrative. It begins with his baptism. He's in the Jordan River, right? And his primo, Juan Bautista, or John the Baptist, his cousin, uh, is baptizing him. And, and, And the author gives us insider information so that we know who is speaking. It's not just a noise from heaven, but there's a voice, and the voice is saying something, and that something is this, you are my son. I'm pleased with you. I am proud of you. I believe in you. And I want to tell you here, our incoming freshmen, our transfer students who are beginning here, know this. God looks at you and says, you are my daughter. You are my son. I'm proud of you before you even get an A in the fall semester. I'm proud of you before you even graduate from APU. I'm proud of you before you go and become that difference maker that I want you to be. I'm proud of you by, very, by the very uh, essence of the fact that you are my child. I look at my three kids. I got a one-year-old, right? My one-year-old has four teeth, and that dude could eat everything, okay? I'm telling you. He'll eat everything. And then when I look at him, I say, man, I am proud of how much that guy could eat. That sounds weird, but I'm his dad, so I get to be that, right? I mean, I'm proud of the fact that he could smile. I'm proud of the fact that he's learning how to stand for like 1.5 seconds, and I'm t- counting, you know, I'm using my stopwatch. All right, he's got a PR right now, 1.5. Today I'm gonna challenge him to get to two. We'll see how that goes. But that's my boy, I am proud of him. I am proud of my daughter. I am proud of my son. God the Father looked at his son Jesus and before Jesus did one miracle, before Jesus preached one sermon, before Jesus died on the cross and got up again on the third day, his heavenly Father looked down on him while he was being baptized and said, this is my boy and I'm really proud of him and he fills my heart. And I want you to know that your parents who are here today feel the same way about you. You might not feel it all the time because some of uh, your parents might have been like my parents and man, they, they expected a lot from me and I felt that, but every once in a while I need to be reminded that they only did that because they wanted what was best for me, but I know that my dad loves me, I know that my mom loves me, and I know that all of the parents who are here love their children so much, otherwise you wouldn't even be here this morning, okay? You would have been like, go to that worship service by yourself, I'm going to Starbucks. <laughs> but you're here, so that says a lot. And the Heavenly Father said, before you do one thing, by virtue of the fact that you're my son, I love you and I'm proud of you. Reminds me of my buddy, I ran track in middle school and my my friend's dad was the track coach and I remember one time my my friend, he was one of the fastest kids in California and he's running the 400 in the state meet and he's going and all I could remember hearing was this big six foot four guy stand up and he goes, that's my son! That's my son! Right? And I'm thinking, that's the same way the Heavenly Father looked at Jesus. That's the same exact way that I want you to feel as you get ready to start classes on Monday. That you are loved. That that, 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 that God is pleased in who you are and in who you are becoming. Imagine if we lived out of security and the love of God and not in insecurity that we are valueless outside of our achievements. According to Parker Palmer, he says this, vocation is not a goal to be achieved, but a gift to be received. A calling, it's a gift to be received. Something that is gonna be given to you. When you know your identity and worth, rather than trying to prove your identity and worth, you're more likely to live out of appreciation, thanksgiving, authenticity, instead of living out of fear, insecurity, or shame. Imagine if it was, our prayer was more like this, God, because of what you've done for me, because of who you are and who you've called me to be, I have an invitation to now walk confidently and boldly in my identity to allow my productivity and achievement to be an outflow of who you've called me to be. You see, the temptation that comes immediately after Satan comes while Jesus is tired, he's vulnerable, he was fasting 
for 40 days and he was weak and it's in those moments that the tempter, the accuser comes and he comes and tries to question his identity, right? He doesn't question what he does, he questions who he is and he says, if you are the son of God. This is the same voice of criticism and self-deprecation, self-loathing, second guessing, feeling defeated, feeling like you're not enough or never will be enough. That's the same voice. That's the voice of the enemy. What I'm here to share to you today is that over the course of your time at APU, our desire as a spiritual life team is to attack that voice with another voice of truth, which is the voice of Jesus in your life. Some of you might be thinking, I'm not really sure who I am. I, 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 you know what, I, I think I'm this, but I, I act like this, so maybe I'm a fake, maybe I'm a fraud, maybe I'll never amount to much, maybe I won't make a difference, maybe I'm not smart enough, maybe I'm not outgoing enough. Who are you to dream? Who are you to think that you're better than somebody else? You might as well give up, because nothing is gonna make you happy. If that voice is the voice that you hear every once in a while from time to time, I wanna encourage you to not listen to that voice. Uh, Parker Palmer in a book called Let Your Life Speak says this, the conventional concept of vocation insists that our lives must be driven by oughts. As noble as this may sound, we don't find our callings by conforming ourselves to some abstract moral code. We find our callings by claiming authentic selfhood, by being who we are. The deepest vocational question is not what ought I to do with my life, but rather who am I and what is my nature? So prayer, prayer is the way that we learn to tune in to the voice of God. It's the way that we learn to quiet all these other voices so that we can hear the right one. It's the way that we move past the static and all the other movies that aren't the ones that we're supposed to be watching so that we can tune in to the voice of God in our lives. You know, the analogy that I love for this one is, uh, uh, again, uh, putting myself back when I was a kid. We used to have these things in our houses called landline phones. Um, that were connected to walls. There was a big cord, and if you were lucky, you had a long cord. And, and so when my wife and I were dating back in high school, right, uh, she had this phone that she would carry, and it had a long cord, so she'd like walk around with the whole phone. Hey, how's it going? Good, yeah. Where are you at right now? In the kitchen. Yeah, the cord's long enough. Yeah, yeah, now I'm back in the living room. Um, but th this landline phone was interesting because, uh, especially back before they had voicemails or call waiting, there was this, this weird sound that if you were already on the phone and somebody else was trying to call, it would just go beep, 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 beep. Nowadays, you could have like 18 people on a call at once. But back then, if you missed a call, you missed it. If you weren't home when they called, you missed it, right? And sometimes we think about listening to God and hearing his voice in that way. Man, I, I, I got to make sure I'm there at the right spot so that I could hear God at the right time when he calls. And when we do that, that causes us to live out of fear that I might miss it and I might not get it. And what I believe is that, interestingly, Smartphones actually give me a better way of understanding communication with God than landline phones. Because maybe communication with God is more like a text thread than a one-time phone call. Maybe it's an ongoing communication where I wake up in the morning, hey, hey Lord, good morning. Would you be with me today as I start my first day of classes? I'm feeling a little bit nervous. Do you think you can help me find where my class is? Where is Wilden? And then God's like, you know, um, talk to your alpha leader. Right? And then, you, and then you text back, thank you, Lord. And he's like, amen, right? And then, and then you go throughout the whole day with this ongoing conversation, right? That's like a text thread, okay? Rather than been feeling like we're gonna miss the voice of God. God is constantly calling. And when he calls, it's not a pocket dial. He's calling on purpose. He wants to speak with you. He wants to hear your voice as well. So I want to finish with this, because this, I wouldn't be a pastor if I didn't give you like four words that rhyme or start with the same letter. So <laughs> here go four Ps. Here you go. Ready? Passion, problem, proficiency, and purpose. As we think about calling, as we think about where I'm headed, who I am, what I'm supposed to be doing, who I'm supposed to be, I want you to think about these four things. The first one is this, passion. Think about the things that light you up. Think about the things that make you stay up late at night because you're so excited about it or wake up early in the morning, kind of like your first boyfriend or girlfriend. Oh, okay, maybe not that. Okay, some other thing that you'll be passionate about. What lights you up? What's the thing that you are willing to suffer for? See, that's the other definition of passion that we often neglect. What is the thing that you're willing to sacrifice in order to attain that thing? So the first one is passion. The next one is problem. 
Okay, so passion isn't enough. The world will say, do whatever you want, have as much happiness as you can. From a biblical, Christ-centered perspective, what we would say is this, find that place where your passion is intersecting with the problem that God is putting on your heart to address. What are the things that break your heart? What are the things that cause you to want to do something about, to see different in the world? God brought you here to APU because there are problems out there that he wants to equip you and prepare you to address as difference makers. What problem do you want to help solve? Um, proficiency. Proficiency. What are, what are the things that you're good at? What are your talents, strengths, skills, some things that you have a propensity to be, to be good at that God has wired you a particular way? Think about proficiency and the ways in which those come together. So we have passion, problem, and proficiency. And the last one is this, purpose. I like to think about it in these ways. When you think about purpose, purpose why you, why here, why now? Why you, why here, why now? You could think about it in the multiple levels. You could think about it, why at APU? Why in Los Angeles, California? Why in the United States of America? Why 2019? Why me and my gifts? Why me and my story? Why me and my background? Why me and my interests and my proficiencies and the problems that are uh, aching my heart? Think about that purpose. So the four are passion, problem, proficiency, and purpose. You see, when Jesus heard the voice of God, that voice was telling him who he was. And he believed that voice and he lived out of that identity affirmation. I want to encourage you, students, families, moms, dads, grandparents, live out of that identity of who you are and who God's calling you to be. Jesus stood up and rather than following the temptation for relevance, rather than following the temptation to be spectacular, rather than following the temptation to be powerful. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because I've been anointed to preach good things to the poor, to declare release to the captive, sight to the blind, freedom to the oppressed, and to usher in a new season of God's work in the world. That's why God has brought you to APU. That's why you're here. So I'm going to invite a couple of my friends, Pastor Tatiana and Karen Rugley. They're going to come forward. Uh, they're going to uh, close us with a couple of uh, uh, prompts for us to think about. But as they do, I'd like to just encourage you, if closing your eyes helps, great. If keeping them open works, great. But I want you to think about those four last things. Uh, passion, problem, proficiency, and purpose. Take a minute or two just to think about what God might be speaking to you as you reflect on the calling that he has in your life. This morning I had the privilege to pray with some of your parents, guardians, and family members this morning, and I was so blessed by the heart-filled and spirit-filled prayers this morning. Um, you could sense the concern um, for their babies, but you can also sense uh, a genuine hope in the Lord that God is going to do a great work in their students. And um, during our time of prayer, I was reminded of even Mary, of how at one point she thought that Jesus was literally going crazy. And so she loved her son so much, she went to where he was teaching and said, hey, I need to find my son, go get him. And what I want to do is encourage the parents. Um, you may not fully agree with the majors that your students have chosen or even being here at APU. And I want to remind you that you're in good company. A Mary had an encounter with an angel that said, the son that I've given you is a miracle and that he's going to save the world. But in that time of doubt and concern, she thought her son was going crazy. And so I want to just encourage our parents in this season when we're talking about call and when we're talking about what God has created your children to do, I would love for you to just surrender your children over to their heavenly father who knit them in your, their, their mother's womb. They, he knew the call in their lives before you even knew their name. That's right. And so we have a tradition here at APU where um, we take a simple piece of chalk 
and we take it to the concrete and we uh, prepare these sweet places of prayer for family and friends to come around and pray. And another thing that I wanna challenge you is that in the circle, we want to write some things that we wanna to commit to the Lord and bring to APU. And if we have fear, concerns, or even sin, we wanna leave those outside of the circle. If you wanna name it, name it. But the things that we wanna bring here into this new season, into this season of transition, we would love to write that in our circles and come together as families to just pray for your students, their future, and this entire APU community. And so we would love to have our commuters and our returners come back to campus tomorrow and see all of these special commitments and even recommitments to the Lord. So on your way out, there's going to be um, chalk that's handed out, and we would love for you to participate in one of these tra many traditions here at APU. As we close our time together this morning, would you join me in prayer as we invite the Holy Spirit? God, we are so, so grateful. We come to you with grateful hearts, Lord, knowing that you have created each and every one of us with a specific calling and purpose. And now for some of these students, as they are getting ready to step foot into that calling, to take maybe one foot forward. God, as it seems like maybe their parents are taking one step back. Jesus, would you remind us that yes, you are Lord. there. Yes, God. You are with each parent as they leave today. You are going with them, Father, that you have not left them, that you have not forsaken them, that you are in the car with them as they're driving away, that you still reside in their home, that you still reside in their churches and wherever it is that they're going today. And God, for every student, as they take one step forward into this new adventure of college, God, would you remind them that you are also here, that you are in their dorm rooms and their apartments and their classes and in chapel and in their service opportunities. Lord, that you have not left them, that you have not forsaken them. God, you are so big and so mighty that you can be in multiple places at one time. Jesus, we pray that you would be the comforter when we need it, that you would remind us of who we are and what it is that we are called to do at this institution and beyond. Thank you for the blessing of APU. Thank you for the legacy of people who have already come through these doors and the lives that have been changed because of this institution and because of your kingdom and your glory. We give you all the praise. In your name we pray. Amen. Go with God, friends. Grace and peace to you. Have a wonderful day.